Good afternoon. I'm Garnet Stokes, president of the University of New Mexico. Thanks to all of you who are joining us in this virtual town hall. It feels really good to be connected to the university community, even remotely, after having to watch our students pack and campus live move to a remote working and learning environment. Part of what is special about being part of a university is the many freedoms we enjoy to express ourselves, to ask questions, to experiment, and learn socially as well as intellectually. UNM faculty, staff, and students have mobilized rapidly to support the continuation of university services during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic and our stay-at-home orders. While it has been challenging, I have been amazed to see the daily acts of courage, compassion, and heroism from members of the Lobo Pack. Like you all, UNM leadership has been adapting to working remotely using many of the same tools that are being used for instruction. Our panelists today are connecting in from their homes using their own devices and internet services and using the university's Zoom service. Should we encounter any technical difficulties today with any of the panelists, we will work through them and continue today's conversation, just as you all have done throughout the last couple of weeks. These are the same tools that, and the same processes that all faculty, staff, and students have been making work in their class sessions and business meetings. And we are grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation with you today. The limits we find ourselves operating under now are unprecedented in the experience of, I suspect, all of us. But we are continuing to operate so that we responsibly provide our students, community, and state with the academic support, ongoing research, and other services expected of and needed from a public research university and an academic medical center, especially in times of national crisis. The University of New Mexico has moved as swiftly and as decisively as possible to fulfill our mission. And I realize in doing so, you have received numerous communications from me, from academic affairs, housing, parking, the Dean of Students, your faculty, from a lot of people. And it is a lot. Uh, I also recognize that guidance has changed and that we could have been clearer or more explicit in our communications, thinking about the little disconnect with extension of spring break when we had an, uh, a remote eight week uh, learning environment for some. I just wanna thank you all for your patience and your realization that this is uncharted territory that is included daily and frankly, sometimes hourly modifications and adjustments. I also wanna thank the healthcare providers, the staff, the faculty, the students, and the administrators who have been working around the clock to face this crisis as one university. We received some 350 questions for this town hall. I wanna say thank you for sharing your concerns and letting us know which issues are most important to you as we go through this pandemic together. In order to appeal to the largest audience, we've chosen to address those questions that were most frequently asked in each category uh, during this town hall. In the limited time we have, I don't believe we'll be able to answer the online Q&A live, but please use the feature on your screen to submit your questions. We will be creating a town hall Q&A page that will address many of the questions that may not be touched upon during this town hall today. That page should be posted next week. The town hall will also be recorded and posted both on my website and the UNM COVID-19 informational site. Today, I will be joined by executive leaders and several members of their teams to address the most prevalent questions submitted in the survey about the many pressing concerns and uncertainty that we are all facing together. 
I'll start the responses by addressing some of the most common, broad, and high-level questions we have received. Number one, what is the plan for the postponement of commencement, convocation, and other recognition ceremonies? There is understandably much anxiety about our announcement that spring 2020 commencement exercises and associated events would be postponed to a later time. That was a really hard announcement to make because it is our favorite event of the year. It's my favorite event. Seeing the graduates and their families, faculty and staff who have supported them along the way to graduation, exuberant at, the, at reaching the end of a gratifying journey is a monumental event at any university. And we would not ever dismiss its significance to all of us. We cannot set a specific date for the event at this time, but hope that late summer or fall are very real possibilities. We are anxious to learn of innovative ways to recognize the class of 2020. So if you have ideas, submit them to the university secretary at UNIVSEC, kind of short for university secretary, UNIVSEC at unm.edu. I will tell you, I've already received a couple of suggestions in my email, and these are things that we will consider. Thank you for sending those. One issue I've heard that I'd like to clarify, some have asked if they can actually graduate if they don't go through commencement. The answer is yes. Commencement is our celebration event, but earning the degree is official when the Board of Regents votes to approve degrees upon the recommendation of the faculty. Second question, how will operations continue for the university beyond the extended spring break that was designated to end April 5th? We quickly took action to suspend our in-person educational delivery for two weeks following spring break, the spring break schedule so that we could align with the directives we were getting from the state, but also the other educational systems in the Albuquerque area. It's become increasingly clear that this crisis and the improvised operations will extend much beyond that, as evidenced by the Public Education Department just this morning, extending the suspension of classes through the end of the school year. We have already made the decision to transition all possible coursework to remote instructional formats and inform students that they should not return to campus from spring break if they have a safe alternative living arrangement. So the bulk of the online educational delivery plan is being continued through the end of the semester. Decisions about summer school followed quickly by the fall semester are on our plates right now. So stay tuned. That's the high level status of the educational mission. We also immediately adhered to guidance and directives from the governor and the Department of Health to limit personal interactions and assign most employees to work remotely. Going forward, we'll need to keep the campus safe, maintained and operational so we can quickly restore all functions when conditions allow. This will require continuous assessment of our employee well-being, human resources policies and financial circumstances, just to name a few considerations. Other specifics surrounding continuing operations, including academic continuity, employee status, and clinical operations will be available during this session and by ongoing updates. Third question, what do we know about the financial impact and future budgetary concerns we face? These questions weigh heavily on everyone's mind and we cannot predict the fiscal impact on our world, our nation, state, or university. But we know it could be substantial, and we know that UNM will not be alone in our predicament. The key variables in this equation are how long this economic pause will last and how long it will take to recover. I have been in communication recently with the governor's office, the Department of Finance and Administration, the Legislative Finance Committee and the Higher Education Department. There is no question that things have taken a stark turn from just a few weeks ago when the state of New Mexico's FY21 budget was signed into law. 
It appears FY20, our current fiscal year that goes through June 30th, will conclude probably without too much disruption, but as State Senator John Arthur Smith stated, we're not looking at if there will be a special session of our state legislature, but when. And the primary intent of that legislative session will be to address the very large shortage in projected revenues for FY21. We are planning strategy with other universities about how best to approach what we may be facing. And there are different perspectives as you can only imagine. As always, we will advocate for what is best for UNM to be able to carry out our multifaceted mission. With the federal government working to shore up the economy, having just passed an historic $2 trillion relief package, the state will get some relief that will reduce some of the economic harm we are projecting. There will undoubtedly be tough decisions that will have to be made. How tough depends on what I've already mentioned about how long this lasts and how long it takes to recover. Our strategy will not be much different than other legislative priorities where we value our people foremost and the research and clinical goals and the people that help carry out our primary educational mission. I'm certain that public research universities are multidimensional solutions to this crisis just like we have been during past periods of disruption in our history. So stand proud of what we will do together as we face these challenges. At this time, I'd like to introduce Vice President of Equity and Inclusion, Dr. Asada Zarai, to share with you a few remarks. Greetings to our precious Lobos. We feel so privileged to work on behalf of the students faculty, staff, and communities connected to UNM at this moment, as always. It's so important to make sure that we all stay connected. So we're excited to be making that happen through this town hall format today. We encourage you to practice self-care and to set aside time to take a walk in your neighborhood, cook some healthy meals, and Zoom or FaceTime with fam family and friends daily as we figure out how to live our best lives or the best lives we can during this new normal. As the coronavirus spreads throughout the US, we urge you to act with thoughtfulness and grace and not let fear and uncertainty impact the way that you treat others. This is an unprecedented time in our history. And though that's true, at UNM, we let our values of equity and inclusion drive our decisions. Even those we're making on a daily basis to promote the well being of the UNM family in this crisis. Unfortunately, acts of racism and xenophobia have been reported towards certain groups, including microaggressions, discrimination, avoidance, harassment, threats, and physical assaults. This includes sharing insight, in, insightful or derogatory messages via social media platforms, which reinforce stereotypes and attack marginalized or other groups. Valuing inclusivity means remembering that we all have different circumstances and treating everyone with respect, both in their presence and in their absence. Please do not resort to unkind discussions about people, individuals, or groups who may not be in your immediate social circle. For more resources, please see the UNM's official COVID-19 website. And we also have equity and inclusion guidance uh, in a document listed there, as well as lists of resources on the diverse.unm website. We wish you health and that you can find moments of respite even during this global pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zarai. Now I would like to introduce Chancellor Paul Roth, he is leading the Health Sciences Center, an essential health center operation at the forefront of this crisis through daily planning for patient care, continuation of education and research. Welcome, Dr. Roth. Okay. I'll start again. <laughs> um, I'm going to be giving a narrative 
with respect to a number of questions that many of you have had in uh, the area of health and what we're doing and what the state might be doing. Uh, and to give you a brief update, globally, uh, we are at, uh, unfortunately, 566,000 individuals who are confirmed to have COVID-19. Uh, the U.S., China, Italy, and Spain have made up 55% of all of those individuals. Um, the U.S., unfortunately, has now surpassed China in the number of individuals uh, who are uh, positive for COVID-19. Um, in New Mexico, <clears throat> as of at least this morning, uh, we have 136 positive uh, cases. And if one were to look at the experience uh, out of China <clears throat> in an effort to understand how long this uh, epidemic will affect us here in uh, New Mexico, from the time that they experienced their very first case until things began uh, plateauing out was uh, about uh, 16 weeks, with a peak at about eight to 10 weeks. In Washington state, uh, they did uh, considerably better. They're now at a point where there are fewer and fewer first uh, cases, uh, new uh, cases, and it's taken them about eight weeks from the time of their first case. And just as a reference point, here in New Mexico, our first case was March the 11th. Unfortunately, there are no reliable predictive models. Every, every state is different. Every country is different. Uh, what uh, modifies the projections are essentially the behavior of the community. Uh, and I'll have just a few words about that in just a couple of minutes. At the state level, the governor and the state uh, agencies responsible for health care, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, are taking this extraordinarily serious, and uh, they have implemented a number of steps in preparation uh, for a potential surge uh, over the course of the next uh, month or two. And in that regard, the uh, governor has uh, created the Medical Advisory Committee. Uh, and uh, in that uh, context, we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, our senior vice chancellor uh, for clinical affairs, Mike Richards, who is um, providing advice to the governor and those secretaries. This happens to be an area of his uh, personal expertise, and we're very fortunate to have him uh, taking an active role in helping the state. Uh, when we have normal uh, provision of health care, uh, it is, it is uh, classified as conventional care. When things get to be uh, at a point where there's a need for a little bit more exceptional response from the medical uh, healthcare industry, we move into a level called contingency care. That's where we are now. Uh, if things get to be... Uh, uh, very uh, seriously uh, increase with a major surge over the next uh, month or so, uh, we would then have to move into something called the crisis level of care. Uh, the country has had uh, a number of uh, episodes in its history in which the medical community has had to respond to disasters and uh, the last one uh, with the H1N1 pandemic. And as a response of that, the Institute of Medicine published a set of guidelines for the healthcare industry uh, in recommendations for how one must uh, respond to that level of severity. And that is called uh, the crisis standards of care. And I'll just read one, ver one uh, excerpt from there that gives you an idea of the, uh, the shift in our thinking in provision of healthcare. It says, public health disasters justify temporarily adjusting practice 
of clinical standards and or shifting the balance of ethical concerns to emphasize the needs of the community rather than those of the individual. That is a big change in how we ordinarily practice medicine, from focusing on doing whatever it takes to save a life and reduce suffering at an individual level, to also consider that now, uh, potentially in a crisis level of care, uh, to also consider what the needs of the full community might be, particularly as it relates to uh, access uh, to uh, scarce medical resources. Um, there's, it's very well defined. The state is actively uh, engaging in that uh, preparation in the event that we would need to shift into that uh, level of response. Uh, and just a word on that. What it takes is a strong ethical foundation to be established. So the way that we conduct healthcare in New Mexico is specifically in connection with our culture, that we come from a state that is particularly diverse. And the manner in which we deliver the health, this healthcare is very much in concert with the expectations of the people and the cultures and the communities that we serve. And so establishing clear standards that serve as the foundation for whatever we do in this uh, more crisis level of care is fundamental in uh, designing the systems going forward. And of course, there are other things like the legal basis for making decisions. Uh, one of the major initiatives now that we're engaged in is uh, working in close coordination with all the other health systems in the state of New Mexico. So not any single history, not any single hospital is doing their own thing. Of course, we're all designing our uh, uh, systems of, of responding to surge, uh, but uh, we're doing that working together. And, uh, and in that fashion, we can deliver a much more efficient and effective uh, healthcare delivery system in New Mexico. Uh, the uh, UNM health system is uh, following the uh, pandemic H1N1 disaster plan that we established back in 2009, 2010. It's of course been updated and it's been modified to uh, incorporate the experiences uh, specific to this pandemic uh, out of China, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Europe. Uh, we follow uh, what's considered best practices in the manner in which we structure our, our response. And that uses the uh, something called the incident command system, a very structured and organized way in which um, multiple units can come together uh, to respond to very uh, complex and severe disaster uh, situations. Uh, part of that calls initially for the creation of an incident management team. Uh, our health system established uh, this IMT weeks before the very first case of COVID-19 even occurred in the state of New Mexico. As soon as there was a first case, it transitioned into something called an emergency operations center in which all uh, efforts associated with a response, uh, monitoring, um, setting up uh, new systems of coordination and um, making decisions are all centralized within this one uh, emergency operations center. That's to maximize the way in which we provide care under these exceptional circumstances. Uh, at the Health Sciences Center, I chair the HSC incident management team. We meet once a day in the morning the EOC meets twice daily. Uh, at the IMT at the Health Sciences Center, we have an opportunity to check in with the EOC as well as all of the academic units, uh, research, our educational programs. We talk about the finances associated with this uh, uh, new mode that we find ourselves in. And then every day, we then meet with the president and her leadership uh, council 
and we review uh, uh, the uh, issues that impact main campus, athletics, the branch campuses. It's all coordinated through the president during those daily uh, meetings with her leadership council. And I would just like to mention a couple of other activities that we're involved in. Uh, we have a number of individuals and organizations that have reached out in uh, asking to see if they could be helpful. And we're trying to centralize volunteers and those types of uh, offers of help uh, through uh, a, a group in the HSC IMT. Uh, and we're doing things like uh, uh, supporting the West Side Shelter for the homeless. Uh, who may require more uh, aggressive types of assessment and uh, treatment to make sure that that vulnerable population is managed. We're also trying to seek out other ways in which we can support our faculty and staff uh, in childcare. With the schools closed and we have essential personnel that need to be continuing uh, their work at the hospital, uh, we're trying to support them in that fashion. Uh, so we're doing a number of things. Our telehealth program is progressing really effectively uh, and we're uh, advancing those types of uh, uh, encounters with our patients. And then in closing, uh, I would just like to point out that patient safety and quality of care and the safety of our uh, health team is our top priority. And I really need to thank all of our healthcare team for the extreme uh, demonstrations of not just uh, quality of care, which they are always uh, demonstrable of, but their compassion and kindness uh, while under pressure in, in, under these circumstances. And secondly, I can't overemphasize the importance of following the Department of Health guidelines stay at home. That should be an easy thing to do, but I know that sometimes it's hard to do. Stay at home. Uh, wash your hands. This is what my mother taught me. I didn't have to go to medical school to, to learn that. Wash your hands. Uh, if you have to leave your home, practice social uh, uh, distancing. Um, and uh, just use common sense. You have to assume that everything you touch has the viral particle on it. Every person you speak to uh, is infected. If you follow those simple rules, we all will do fine. And this is all choices. You make, uh, if you make uh, choices uh, that are positive, they will be uh, positive for you and all your loved ones. So with that, let me turn uh, the uh, floor over to uh, Dr. Pitcher, who is our Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs to answer some other questions that you might have on the health system. Thank you, Dr. Roth. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we've received a, a number of questions um, that I'll try to address uh, in, in some of my commentary. Uh, we've had questions uh, which are inevitable. People are worried and concerned. And we've had questions from a number of our staff who are not directly related to the delivery of clinical care, but who remain essential to our clinical mission. Um, we have to be reminded that even though we're facing a pandemic, we still have care to deliver to our patients uh, on a daily basis. Disease does not go away in a pandemic. Um, and so to those staff, I want to reassure you that we are indeed doing everything we can to identify who can work from home, who still needs to be in the clinical environment, um, and how we can best protect you uh, and protect our patients as we do that. This continues to be an evolving process, um, but we, we are hearing your concerns and we are trying to address those 
and we're trying to also uh, continue to provide great care to our patients who need it. Um, there have been a lot of questions around uh, personal protective equipment for our healthcare staff. Um, the guidelines on this tend to shift, uh, and we are following current best practices from the CDC, uh, from uh, uh, what has been learned at the University of Washington, the University of Nebraska, and elsewhere, um, in terms of what is the appropriate PPE required for our healthcare workforce uh, during this pandemic period. Um, uh, currently, we are using the highest level of PPE protection for our healthcare workforce who are direct, directly interacting with uh, COVID positive patients or uh, suspected COVID patients. Uh, in addition, we are assuring that we've got reasonable supplies uh, of all the necessary uh, personal protective uh, equipment that we need. We're currently in pretty good shape there. Um, and we're also providing uh, standards of PPE protection uh, for our healthcare workforce that are not in direct contact with COVID positive patients or suspected patients, um, but help provide some degree of additional protection when working in the healthcare environment. These standards continue to, to, to change, but we stay on top of those and we're following the very best practices and doing our very best to assure that we have an ongoing uh, supply of the necessary PPE equipment going into the next several weeks uh, and months. Uh, we've also taken some fairly aggressive steps to free up hospital capacity and reduce the use of uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, we've done this by uh, postponing uh, elective surgical procedures. And by elective surgical procedures, uh, I mean those surgical procedures that could be delayed for up to three months without causing any unnecessary harm to a patient. Uh, it doesn't mean that elective surgeries are unnecessary. It just means that they could be postponed. Uh, so far, we've uh, postponed well over 300 uh, elective surgical procedures. This has freed up a significant amount of our hospital capacity uh, and allowed us to prepare for uh, a potential surge in patients in the coming weeks. Uh, we continue to work with Tricor and our state to try and increase our testing capacity. Uh, currently, Tricor has uh, been able to ramp up to over a thousand uh, tests per day uh, that they're able to process and they will be going up to 2,000 tests per day uh, hopefully by this weekend. Um, and by that time they hope to have reduced the backlog that may have occurred early on. Um, there have been uh, questions about how we're supporting at-risk staff in the hospital or clinic environment. Uh, there are some very well-established guidelines from the CDC that direct us in this manner. Uh, they, we've uh, put out guidance for uh, pregnant uh, work, healthcare workers, and we also have guidance put out for uh, immunocompromised uh, or, or older patients with multiple chronic or providers with multiple chronic medical conditions. Um, for those, uh, working with occupational health, we are able to provide the appropriate kind of working environment uh, for those uh, healthcare workers. Uh, so that's done on a case by case basis. Um, otherwise, uh, our, our healthcare workforce is being provided the appropriate uh, and necessary personal protective equipment when working uh, in the clinical environment, as I discussed uh, previously. Thank you, Dr. Roth. Great, thank you, Dr. Pitcher. Uh, and to very briefly address uh, issues uh, regarding general safety, uh, we have Dr. Christina Biato, who is our Executive Director for Health Policy. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you, President Stokes, for holding this. And I want to say that um, really, I know. 
the anxiety out there is palpable. Lots of people are worried, but basic social distancing, hand washing, and really taking common sense precautions. We, can, we are already seeing great results from this. This is something we can beat. This is something that the anxiety level, the more we learn, at least my own anxiety level has dramatically gone down. I'm very positive that we will have very good news in the coming weeks, both on the treatment protocol area, on all kinds of good things and, and models that are gonna show that we are getting farther ahead. But we cannot lose sight of wearing um, protective mechanisms when we're providing care to patients, of being cautious to practice good social distancing at all times, and to please good, do good hand washing. And we are available to answer your questions and to provide support as you need it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beato. And finally, to address some uh, concerns and questions around the Health Sciences Center academic uh, programs. We have Dr. Amy Levi, who's our Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Thank you, Dr. Roth, and um, thank you everybody for tuning in for this very important communication opportunity. I would like to just address quickly a handful of questions that have been coming through both the website and while we've been on this webinar. One is that program managers, program directors, deans all have information about your progress. Um, the provost office, my office on the health sciences side has been in close contact with the individuals who are managing your grades, your graduation requirements, the requirements for your credentialing as you go through these educational processes. So please direct those questions directly to them because they know the answers. Um, we are all working together to ensure the success of our students during this incredibly chaotic time. And as everybody's noted, the information that we have put forward is changing rapidly. The APS closure of the school till the end of the school year just happened before we started this. So um, please continue to monitor your email for the communications that we will be sending out to you on everything from grading to graduation to how you will succeed in your chosen programs. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Roth and members of his leadership team. Your uh, thoughts were very helpful. Now I'd like to introduce Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, James Holloway, uh, who will address a series of concerns that were posted uh, via the survey. Um, welcome, James. Thank you, President Stokes, and, and thanks to all of you for participating in this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, one of, we hope, uh, uh, a number of continuing ways that we can try and communicate with the UNM uh, community. Um, and so I'll, I'll dive into a series of questions uh, and then introduce a couple of other individuals who will take up some others as well. Uh, but many of the questions uh, really have a, a couple of broad themes to them. Of course, there's a general theme of concern uh, and anxiety among all of our populations. And of course, that's, that's beyond academics. Uh, that's uh, in our personal lives, uh, in our in concern for our health and the health of our loved ones. And it's worth recognizing that all of us feel those same concerns. Students feel those concerns, faculty feel those concerns, staff feel those concerns. Uh, and uh, so we, we truly are uh, in this together and, and working through a set of uh, challenges. Uh, in, in a moment like this, it's worth reviewing what the principles are that we're thinking about as we deal with this challenging moment. Um, and the two challenges or the two principles that we're um, uh, working under are one that we have to protect the health of the people of New Mexico as well as the health of the people of UNM. And at the same time, we have to protect the present lived experiences and the futures of our students. Uh, and the, also really that we're committed to um, ensuring that our students can complete courses and graduate and we're committed to our mission of discovery and research. 
And, and so those are the drivers in our thinking about uh, where we are and where we're going, protecting health, protecting our students, protecting the very important uh, uh, efforts that our students have put into courses and graduation, uh, and protecting our mission of discovery. And I think it's important to say also that this is not the time to give up. This is the time to persist and find ways to succeed. Many of the questions that uh, were posed to us relate really to where we are in the instructional enterprise. Uh, so the period March 23rd through April 5th, originally we thought of as a time where there would be no in-person instruction, limited campus presence. And, and at the time when we started down that path, we hoped that we would come back by April 5th with some remote instruction and some in-person instruction. But as we've heard, things changed quickly. Uh, and so at this point, we're headed fully to remote instruction to the largest extent possible. 98% of the course sections on the uh, Albuquerque campus of UNM are now set up to continue in remote instruction to the rest of the term. Uh, the term still slated to end on May 16th. Uh, similar uh, fractions of classes uh, at the branch campuses are set up to move into remote instruction. The formats of these vary greatly. UNM is a, a, is a vast set of educational experiences ranging from art to nursing to history and different approaches are being taken by uh, different faculty and different programs. So, so no one size fits all, ranging from fully online uh, approaches to uh, low bandwidth, asynchronous uh, sharing of assignments and, and um, uh, uh, chats through UNM Learn, um, delaying of, of uh, hands-on skill-based experiences until after the end of term, all kinds of, of approaches are being taken. And I'm really actually amazingly impressed by the, uh, the resilience and creativity of our faculty, our staff, and our students in coming up with all these structures. Research is also still ongoing at a limited, limited rate. Students are mostly absent from research labs. Uh, students are being asked to stay at home, work on data analysis, work on writing, work on background research that uh, work, it's the time to work on the, uh, uh, the ever popular uh, uh, survey portion of your dissertation. Um, Field, some field research is continuing and there are exception processes for students who need to have presence in labs for particular reasons. So that's the broad scope of, of kind of where the instructional enterprise is in undergraduate and graduate uh, education. Um, a number of students have asked how they can perform uh, and perform at their best in this time of disruption. We have questions around internet access, the students under stress, um, confusion. Uh, I should say that uh, the same is true for all of us. We all have, uh, um, we're all working as quickly as we can within the um, uh, rapidly changing circumstances. So I think it's important to remember it's a hard time for everyone. Uh, uh, Dr. Zarai made this point earlier. This is the time to remember to exercise, remember to talk to friends, remember to sleep well. We're putting together uh, a whole set of, of resources to try and support people. We ask faculty to reach out to the Academic Technologies Group and the Center for Digital Learning. We've hired additional consultants in those offices to help support faculty moving online. Uh, the UNM Faculty Senate has taken swift action to support students, introducing a credit, no credit uh, option for students, um, asking faculty to treat the period from March 23rd to April 5th as a soft, soft launch period for these new instructional modes, and so to avoid high stakes um, uh, assessments during that period. Um, we've rolled out a program to support students who don't have laptops, uh, we have a program of, of grants for internet connections uh, that uh, have uh, gone out this week as well. I think it's important to mention that the Lobo Food Pantry is open, and so please check out the Lobo Respect webpage because we know many of our students uh, are uh, food insecure as well as housing insecure. Um, most importantly, remember to communicate. Um, communicate with your instructor, communicate with your chair, communicate with the, your associate dean. Don't skip those steps. Go from your instructor to your chair to your associate dean to the provost's office. The, the folks closest to your instruction have the best knowledge of how to address the challenges you have. And 
you know, we're doing lots of communications by email, so pay attention to those. But don't forget that uh, you can also pick up a phone and give people a call. Phones are being forwarded, messages are being checked. Uh, and so uh, use all of those tools to communicate. So what resources are currently available uh, on, uh, on campus? So Dane Smith Hall is open, provides internet access, um, the computing pods there are open. We have a contingency plan if the uh, if we need more access to uh, computing pods, uh, we're limiting computing pods to five uh, students, uh, five uh, occupants per pod. We have a contingency plan to open more if needed. The library is open fully online. Use the Ask a Librarian uh, tool. Um, use the, your subject librarians, see the library webpage. They can provide most of their resources, most of their print material through online systems. And so um, do realize that while the library building is not accessible, the library really is open online. Shack and their pharmacy are open. Uh, the advising uh, services are um, available online. CAPS and other tutoring is online. Financial aid and the registrar are accessible online. Uh, the student identity centers are running online. So again, contact any of these offices by email, by phone, through their websites. Um, they're, they're there to try and support you at this time. Um, also, specific school and college facilities um, are available for specific students as well. So talk to your chairs. It's, there are students working on campus under uh, limited and supervised conditions. And so do reach out to your department chairs or your faculty about what specific school resources may be open. Uh, there's a set of questions around, should I drop classes? Should I get tuition, uh, uh, drop out of the term and, and get some tuition back? I would say this is not the time to give up. This is the time to persist. Um, seek help, make sure you're using resources, but really this is a time to make sure that the, the investment that you've made in this term uh, really is rewarded. Um, we've arranged uh, systems uh, so that you can get credit for classes. Um, we can provide uh, education through distance instruction. So really this is the time to, to move ahead. Our classes are still gonna achieve their critical learning objectives. Um, and, and I think it's also important to remember you spend 6% of your life when you're in, in uh, college in a classroom. The other 94% of your life is the rest of the educational experience and I think this term, this isn't the learning experience that any of us expected, but we are all learning a lot through this process and we're growing and developing. And so remember that as well. Uh, this is a, a, a chance, an opportunity in which you can learn new skills, learn new ways of doing things. So now uh, we have Associate uh, um, Provost uh, Dr. Pamela Cheek, who's going to talk to us about remote instruction. Thank you. It's a real privilege to be here, and it's lovely to be with, with all of you on what is from the East Mountains, where I'm, I'm speaking to you from a very rainy and hail-driven day. So forgive the sound in the background if you hear the, the pattering of hail. Um, so I wanted to begin by echoing some of the remarks made by Provost Holloway. One thing we know from the research about education is that we're not born with the ability to use the internet or without the ability to use the internet. We can all learn to use the multiple tools that are available to us. And in fact, it's a process of playing with them and not a giving in to the sense that they master us that will allow us to be successful in this environment. Many of us have forgotten to turn the mute button off um, and um, you know, made a, a visual uh, comment to the rest of our group in a Zoom that we've forgotten to do that. Many of us have had challenges learning how to record a lecture or um, upload a particular document. But these are things that we can learn. And in fact, one of the things that I think is um, profound and moving about this moment is the way that it reminds us that every single discipline that we offer at the University of New Mexico matters. And it matters right now. Everyone who is here on this Zoom joining you, every one of you out there who is learning to do something different, you are all learning something that matters in times of peace, spirit, and that especially matters in a time of crisis. 
to be able to make a reference to a playwright you care about or to be able to print um, using um, a 3D printer, um, uh, some kind of de medical device that will help with the shortage of PPP PPE equipment. All of these things matter. Data analysis matters as well. So as you wonder about whether you should persist this semester, think about the importance of completing your degree for times of prosperity, but also for times of crisis. All of your disciplines matter and your ability to pursue them and to succeed in them matters. As Provost Hallway mentioned, there are many resources available on campus. Just reach out and take advantage of CAPS if you're a student. Take advantage of the Center for Digital Learning if you're a faculty member. And again, above all, try out the technology. For students who have been reporting to us via a variety of For students who are worried, sorry, I think that was the, the atmosphere, I apologize. For students who are worried about um, taking advantage of various technologies, have a virtual meeting or study group with other friends. Set up your own Zoom. See what happens when you're controlling the apparatus um, and get together with other people while, while you're doing it. Um, set up a time to share information uh, remotely with other friends. Use old school technology like telephones or, or text or, or Instagram. If you are anxious about completing through to the end of the semester, to echo what a professor, Pro Provost Holloway said, be in contact with your instructor and instructors be in contact with your students. But be aware too that we read emails poorly and we're quick to misunderstand them. And so give your instructor and give your students and give staff members another chance to clarify what they mean and what they intended to say. I've seen numerous um, email chains or records in which um, a faculty member thought a student was saying something, a student thought a staff member or a faculty was saying something, and in fact, it was the very opposite. So I encourage you to give the people that you're working with a chance peacefully and calmly to clarify what they're doing. To hit another theme of the larger conversation, we are all having to adjust to changing circumstances all the time. And that means that taking advantage of the resources that are available and communicating clearly, again, giving somebody an extra chance to communicate clearly is especially important because what we will be doing will change over time, depending on the new information that's available. Um, as you face your technology anxiety, recognize that everybody else has te technology anxiety too, even the most adept among us. It is a rule of thumb for faculty that as soon as you try to turn on your PowerPoint or some other device in the classroom, it will not work for you. It will, it will happen to all of us the first time around. Give it another try, play with it, take control of it. And above all, remember that a university education is about learning. We're all learning in a crisis environment and you can do that too. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cheek. I'd now like to introduce uh, Vice President for Enrollment Management, Dan Garcia, who will talk to us a little bit about issues of uh, the credit, no credit process and financial aid. Sure, thank you, Provost. Um, well, one of the biggest questions we get is how will this work? How will credit, no credit work? Students can opt in to credit, no credit for spring 2020 courses in which they are currently enrolled and the courses will count toward uh, degree requirements and graduation requirements in virtually all cases. If there's any question about it, we encourage students to talk with their advisor or their faculty member, but the process is simple and it's outlined on our registrar's website uh, at unm.edu. So we encourage you to take a look at that. We're asking that requests for this term be made by May 21st, so there's still plenty of time. <clears throat> and again, while it's true that normally courses must be taken for a letter grade in many degree programs and to fulfill graduation requirements, I'm gonna reiterate again, in spring 2020, 
courses taken for credit, no credit, will be counted toward degrees and graduation requirements in most, if not all cases. Um, there will also be no fees for switching from credit to non-credit, uh, credit, credit non, no credit. So we, would, we don't want anybody to be alarmed that uh, some of the fees that we've had in place in the past uh, are, are in place right now. One of the questions that we get quite a bit relates to how is this semester going to impact financial aid and scholarships? First, I wanna say that while we may not be able to answer every question during this town hall, as Provost Holloway noted, we are accessible online. Financial aid website has great information and resources, including mechanisms to ask questions through live chat, through email, upload documents and so forth. But some examples of questions that we've gotten include, uh, if a student takes credit, no credit in place of letter grades, drops a course, withdraws completely, and or if the GPA and number of credits completed is impacted this semester, what's going to happen in financial aid and scholarships? Well, the very first thing I wanna say is that UNM will be very flexible in financial aid evaluations. We've been given wide latitude from state and federal authorities to utilize what we call professional judgment. And in these uncertain times surrounding higher education uh, and ability to attend face-to-face -face and so forth, uh, they've been even more flexible. So this includes flexibility in looking at student grade point average, course drops, withdrawals in spring 2020. For example, Grades of credit in spring 2020 will not affect a student's grade point average and will not disqualify a student from federal, state, or UNM financial aid or support. In addition, fall 2019 cumulative GPA can serve as the basis for evaluation for state aid programs as well as UNM scholarships if it is higher and more favorable than the spring 2020 cumulative GPA. Finally, we expect as a result of pending federal legislation that students who must withdraw may receive loan cancellation for the portion of a direct loan associated with a payment period, which the student did not complete due to this emergency. And according to the legislation, attempted credits not completed will not count against the student's satisfactory academic progress calculations. So finally, one last time, we know and want you to know that we have flexibility on aid adjustments for students that have to withdraw from courses, who have to take credit, no credit, who have to drop, who may not earn a GPA because of taking credit, no credit. And we have this, this, uh, this authority granted to us and latitude from state and federal agencies. We want you to know that. Thank you, Vice President Garcia. We received a number of questions about the future as well, and so I'd like to address uh, those uh, a little bit. And so we've received questions about uh, summer and fall classes and what we expect. Um, we expect at this point to have a summer session. What we don't know is whether it will be with remote instruction or in person. Um, registration for that will uh, start in a couple of weeks and uh, additional information is forthcoming. The same for the fall. I'm, I think we're much more confident that we will plan a fall term that is um, in person um, with uh, greater attention to the contingencies that might arise if, uh, if that um, proves not to be uh, viable. Uh, but again, we, we fully expect to have courses this summer and, and in the fall, uh, but the details of that are still being worked out. Um, we, we also, some of our units have already planned um, additional classes for the summer to uh, help students who uh, might be uh, knocked off track a little bit this uh, term as well. Uh, we've been asked about transcripts and degree conferrals, uh, and there's no delays in the production of uh, final transcripts or degree conferrals uh, anticipated. And so we're keeping uh, the term, uh, the term will end on, on May 16th as normal. Uh, those of you who are graduating um, will have the ability to do, do so uh, through the, uh, the credit, no credit process that the uh, Senate has put in place. Um, uh, there are a number of provisions of that that allow students to receive credit uh, even if a class can't fully continue. 
also received questions about whether the entire future of the University of New Mexico will be online. Uh, of course, part of the, you know, the University of New Mexico is not new to online education. We have a robust set of offerings that are already online. Um, but I don't see the future of, of higher education as being fully online. I don't see UNM as uh, suddenly deciding because of this experience that we will go fully online. Uh, so much of, of what we do as, as humans uh, receives value from being in each other's presence, uh, learning as a social activity. Uh, and so uh, I think we'll learn a lot. Uh, a number of faculty uh, have, have expressed uh, um, interest in, in how they're, because of having to make these changes, they're developing new ideas about how to break up uh, some of their assignments and some of their work uh, uh, with students. So I think we will learn new ideas about how we deliver education, not just remotely, but in person as well. And I've also received questions about, you know, should we register for classes in the summer and fall? Should we arrange for housing in the fall? And I think the answer is yes. Um, if there's reason for you to take classes in summer and fall, once we get that schedule out, um, sign up for classes, secure your dorm room, uh, um, secure your apartment lease. This is a, the, the, the public health challenge we're going through right now is very real. It's very serious, but it will pass. Um, there will be a, a time when the world is not driven by the immediate needs of social distancing. And, and so we should all plan ahead for that, even as we work through the challenges of the moment. So thanks a lot. And President Stokes, back to you. Thank you, Provost Holloway and members of your team. Um, some great answers to the questions we received and you know, good answers to the concerns that um, were reflected in the many questions and comments. So finally today, we have Senior Vice President for Finance and Administration, Teresa Costandinidis, along with members of her leadership team. And a lot of the questions we got are related to uh, uh, parts of uh, Finance and Administration. So uh, Senior VP Costandinidis, take it away. Thank you so much, President Stokes. And I also want to echo my thanks for the many questions we received, both in the initial survey and also we've been monitoring the Q&A list that's coming in as part of this webinar. So um, we will do our best to answer the many, many questions either right now or in response afterwards in an FAQ. So send in your questions. We are definitely monitoring them. Since much of the interest was related to university employment, I've asked Vice President for Human Resources, Dorothy Anderson, to address some of the most commonly asked questions received so far. So Dorothy. Okay, uh, again, thank you for having me. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my Wi-Fi, so I apologize if I fade in and out, and, and so um, know that beforehand. So I decided to take a, a much more um, direct approach to the questions and kind of read them to you because I think many of them have basically the same theme, even though they may not have the same words. So the first one I think was probably one of the most difficult ones and it's, do you anticipate an extension in the time staff will be working from home? And they said, we're still on this, told we're gonna be working from home through the sixth. This doesn't even match what the governor is saying with her stay at home regulations. And also they said for our tier three employees, how long can we expect to keep getting paid? And for me, this is probably one of the most difficult ones to answer because we really don't have a response. Uh, an answer, quite honestly. You know, you heard from Dr. Roth and the other experts from HSC, and this isn't going to be over in a couple of weeks. Um, this is kind of our new reality for a little while. So even though no decisions have been made, your leadership team, the president and the, the provost and the chancellor and Teresa are, are meeting on a regular basis. They ask for a significant amount of data to help drive decisions. And as soon as we know anything, we will share that with the campus. Um, the next question we received, or we received a number of times, was regarding Tier 1 employees. So the question was, will staff who have been designated Tier 1, regardless of their HSC or main campus, receive hazard pay since they have to be coming into the office? 
And we said, well, you know, UNM leadership really recognizes and appreciates the value of tier one employees and the fact that they're coming into the office. They understand that they're providing these essential and critical functions during this really difficult time. Um, leadership has been working with the various departments and basically trying to identify solutions where maybe we can rotate staff stagger hours so we can at least reduce the number of employees on campus um, but at this point in time no decision has been made to provide additional compensation for our tier one physically reporting on campus um, so another question and i think this kind of goes with some of uh, provost holloway's questions the question was is there any chance that at some point all university coursework will stop resulting in furloughs for faculty or staff? If so, would this include temporary loss of income and benefits for ourselves and our families? Again, this is, this is a tough question to answer. So, you know, we're currently planning for the continuation of university coursework, whether it's online or in person, um, where we're making every effort to support the community um, through difficult and uncertain times. We can't guarantee that there's not gonna be some change in our situation or circumstance that might result in some of our employees um, having a, a temporary loss in pay and benefits. Um, again, as soon as we have any information or if that decision is made, we understand these are our employees' lives and we'll convey that information as soon as it's available. So again, um, no, no decisions have been made in that regard. Um, another question was our department was recently asked about current job postings and whether or not uh, these positions were critical and they asked does that mean that there's going to be a hold on hiring and for those of you that don't know that yes we implemented a suspension on staff hiring we implemented this last week um, however any um, position or requisition that needs to go forward that supports a critical position um, supporting an essential function, any of our clinical roles, our IT position, our student support, our facilities, those will go through seamlessly. There's also an exception process that can go through our appropriate EVPs and our president. Um, so yes, we have suspension for staff positions, but at the same time, we realize we need to keep hiring to keep our university going. Um, the last one was, how will work study work now? An uh, individual wrote in and said, my job requires me to be on campus and I cannot work until the campus reopens. I need to support myself with my work study job. Thank you, exclamation mark. And, and for those of you that don't know, yesterday President Stokes and her leadership team decided that UNM will continue to pay student employees that meet UNM employment eligibility requirements um, through the end of the semester. So again, I think that's my last question. And, and again, I wanna thank everyone um, for all they're doing to support uh, the university campus. Uh, Teresa? Thank you so much, Dorothy. So I'd now like to answer some of the questions that we received in the areas of campus safety, housing, and also ser services for the campus. So in the area of campus safety, there were several questions related to our UNM police department. And the question of whether or not the UNM police and security will still be doing their walking and bike patrols, even though the campus is down in its number of campus workers? And the answer to that is yes, the UNM police department is fully operational and our officers are now patrolling the campus and continue to patrol the campus 24 seven, checking all the buildings, ensuring the campus is as safe as possible. In fact, the police patrols have actually increased because during this time of limited operations, the police have not been getting as many calls for direct service. So you'll see more police officers out and about making sure the campus is secured. So a follow-up question related to that is if the, all of the departments on campus are on an abbreviated schedule and many working from home. If the police is at full staff, how come they're not practicing social distancing? Um, also, if they have to be there, and this relates to one of the questions Dorothy had about um, shouldn't they be compensated at, for risking their lives every day? I just want to say we are immensely grateful to the police officers and this police staff who are essential personnel all the time and who as part of their expected employment do risk their lives every single day even during normal times 
So whereas all of us should be practicing social distancing, unless proximity is important for an officer safety or a task the officers are performing, we agree they should be practicing social distancing. And we have passed along that recommendation to the chief of police to share with the officers and police staff. In the questions related to housing, we received a lot of questions from parents with, um, of students about information about what's going on in our campus housing. One of the common questions is, will my student receive a prorated refund on her housing and meal plan for the remainder of the spring 2020? And the answer is that students who have checked out of our residence halls by March 24th or who made alternate arrangements with UNM Residential Life Services will be receiving a prorated refund for their housing and meal plan charges for the spring semester. So the refunds will be, po will be posted to student bursar accounts. Um, many have asked when we might see those. We're saying we hope to see them all by the end of next week, if not sooner. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact housing at unm.edu. They're there to answer your questions. A variation on this theme has come in from many parents about students from outside of the state who may not be able to come back and get their possessions. We have one student who is an arts major who also has possessions in the art locker at the art department. So what do we do? How do we get our possessions? And again, the answer is the same. Please contact housing at unm.edu um, to make arrangements to collect dorm room possessions. We, um, some are coming in a little bit later to get the, um, the possessions. Others are making arrangements to have possessions shipped to them. And if you have um, possessions that are in one of our campus departments, contact that department office to see about getting those possessions also. One set of questions had to do with whether or not students would even be allowed to stay on campus. What about international students and what about those with on-campus jobs? We do have a limited number of students who are remaining in our residence halls and will remain in the residence halls until the end of the semester. We wanted to make sure that all of our students had a safe place to move and access to technologies to continue their studies. But for those students, and there's a limited number who were not able to be in either in a safe place or have the technology to do their schoolwork, we have allowed them to stay on campus. Um, one of the other questions had to do with students who can't get back to check out. And as I mentioned, if you have any issues about that, please contact housing at unm.edu for assistance. The final area I wanted to talk about were questions related to the services that, camp that are provided on the campus during this time of limited operations. And indeed, the services are more limited. One of the questions came in about transportation services. And since we are in limited operations, we have asked the staff and faculty to remain home and we have suspended our campus shuttles. Those are main campus shuttles. Now UNM hospital shuttles are continuing to operate on the North Campus to support clinical activities. Finally, a common one, and this actually Dr. Cheek re um, referred to it, but I want to speak a little bit more since we got quite a few questions about students for whom it's difficult to do their scholarly work at home for whatever reason. The questions came in about the Dane Smith computer pod and will we keep it open? And also a question about why are we developing online courses if students are not able to do that kind of work? Well, in our recent technology surveys of UNM students, students self-reported that there really are high levels of technology ownership and access to the internet. But though we obviously are encouraged by that, we know absolutely that not every student has the access that they need. So there really is some wonderful information available that IT has put together on a collection of resources to help students with the transition to online learning. If you go into at.unm.edu, that's academic technologies, at.unm.edu, you'll see a pull down menu in the coronavirus area with a laundry list of student resource information to help with that transition to remote learning. It has information with maps about Wi-Fi accessibility in and around the campus and the city. It's, there are many outdoor settings when you can socially distance but still have access to the internet. There's also information about discounted and free commercial internet services that are available to students and information about our tribal communities and services that are available there. We have a laptop checkout program that offers preference to students with the greatest need. 
And we are maintaining and hope to do it for the entire semester, open hours at Dane Smith Hall to provide both indoor wireless connectivity, but also that computer pod with computers and printing services. So as long as we are permitted to do that, we'll keep that open. And our, also another great resource is our UNM IT help desk. So you can call them on the phone if you can't get through to technology, but they also are available online. And we really wanna reinforce, we're here to support our students as they make their transition to the online remote technology. Thanks so much. That's it, Garnet. Thank you, Teresa. That was very, very helpful. So we have just a few more moments and I thought we could, uh, uh, I could mention a couple of questions that I've seen come across here. Um, I know there are plenty more questions for us to answer. And as I mentioned, when we first got started, we will be taking all of those questions and putting them, uh, uh, answering them and putting them up uh, next week. And I think, uh, you know, we'll look for feedback on this format. Um, and uh, we'll really strongly consider the possibility that we will do these kinds of online uh, Zoom meetings with our community more frequently, uh, depending upon you know, the types of questions we might decide uh, to focus on particular, um, uh, particular themes. Uh, but we'll see, we'll, we'll play this by ear and do what appears to be in the best interests of what you need from us as institutional leaders. So one question that, uh, that I, has come in is, um, how is UNM responding to uh, everyone's anxieties about um, classes, about timely graduation, about job security? You know, are there specific uh, resources available uh, that can help those with going through these transitions? Um, I wonder if uh, uh, either uh, Vice President Zarai or Provost Holloway or Pamela Cheek, uh, Dr. Cheek might have um, some uh, comments to make about that. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in and say that um, you know, uh, within that same theme of questions, there's certainly been a number of questions about mental health and counseling services. Uh, and I mentioned SHAC was open. SHAC is also providing mental health um, services. Other counseling services for faculty and staff are also available. Uh, and so do look to those resources. Um, I think um, um, so, so there are those kinds of specific resources, but I do want to go back to um, something that, that um, Vice President Sarai said, because it's, it's like washing your hands. It's so simple, it doesn't seem like it's an answer. Um, but washing your hands is a hugely important answer because it actually kills this virus. Um, but exercise, sleep, eat right, remain healthy is an incredibly important tool here. Thank you so much, Provost Holloway. I also wanted to mention that the UNM Student Service Centers um, are holding both uh, um, hours in terms of, you know, you can call in or email them, um, but they also are doing virtual events um, as well as um, UNM housing. Um, and so that's one way to get connected so you don't feel so isolated. Um, and uh, many of those events link up to various communities. So for example, the LGBTQ Resource Center um, is doing some specific uh, programming um, for Asian, Asian American students um, who are LGBTQ, for example. And so take a look at the uh, coronavirus website, um, the general website that UNM has set up, and you'll see a link uh, to those resources. Thank you. And I'll just add to all of this that you have options as, as students and you have some options as, as, as faculty and as staff. Um, first of all, one option is to opt into communicating and communicating well, as I was mentioning. But another option as, as a student is to exercise the credit, no credit choice if that's going to work well for you. Um, and, and you can exercise that choice up until the end of the semester. Um, so you have a lot of time to make a decision. And as you exercise that choice, you're going to want to be in communication with faculty 
and also with advisors. So maybe right now, the right thing to do is to stick with the letter grade, but know that you have a choice and that you can move to credit, no credit, without a consequence for your degree program. That's a student decision that can be made best in consultation with your advisor who's available remotely to you and with your instructor who's also available remotely to you. Thank you all. Um, another question that I see has been asked a number of times, and this will be uh, for Chancellor Roth or anyone else on his team. Um, uh, I'm dealing with a little technology here when things get hidden on my screen. Um, uh, if the COVID-19 is seasonal and there happens to be another wave in the fall, um, any thinking about what will happen? Uh, well, um, that would not be an unpredictable uh, uh, thing that might occur. Uh, there's actually two uh, things that might happen uh, as time goes on that would represent uh, a, a slight increase in occurrence uh, uh, with this particular virus. So one is the seasonal change. Uh, it, at this point, it's very unclear as to what um, the change in weather will do with this particular virus. We know what happens with the with influenza, in that it does tend to be less so in uh, in the summertime. But we have no idea how coronavirus uh, will uh, react in that setting. Um, the second area is uh, is as we begin seeing uh, reductions in the incidence of uh, new cases, which we fully expect to, to occur in the next many weeks. Um, the tendency is to relax a lot of the restrictions that are acceptable public health um, maneuvers to reduce uh, the occurrence of, of, uh, of this disease. Uh, in uh, communities where that has happened, they've identified a, uh, a quick uh, recurrence of the infection rate. And so uh, we have to be vigilant in that if we see, if we begin seeing reductions in numbers of cases, we have to continue exercising these public health restrictions. Uh, otherwise, we will see a, uh, a recurrence uh, only a few weeks after relaxing the, these restrictions. So there would be, it's unknown about the seasonal variation, um, and uh, we just have to be vigilant on continuing our uh, guidelines from the Department of Health. Thank you, Dr. Roth. Um, one question that came in is, is credit, no credit, an option for dual credit students? Um, who can best take that on? Dr. Cheek. So um, the public education department has been issuing guidelines um, around credit, no credit, um, and around continuation of the semester. And I'm going to have to reconsult those guidelines in order to provide a good answer to that. So we'll put that in the follow up messaging so that we have exactly what the public education department has determined. That's a public education department um, specification and not UNM specific. Thank Let you. me address some of the other questions surrounding that on credit, no credit. Um, Dr. Cheek uh, emphasized the importance of talking to your advisor about credit, no credit. One reason for that is that in certain professional programs and uh, programs with professional licensure, there may be implications around that licensure. Uh, and so particularly in the health science fields, you need to really connect with your advisors to know what can work and what can't in that, um, in that sphere. Thank you. Um, another question that I see here, um, I'm not sure we'll be able to get a very specific answer to this somewhat specific question, but the broader question, which I have heard from others. 
Um, are there regular sterilization measures taken to clean the campus public areas like the elevator at the student housing, particularly the buttons in the elevator? Teresa? <laughs> I'll take that question. Thank you. Um, the UNM custodians are currently doing what we call cleaning for health, which means really focusing on areas in our buildings that pe where people touch services. That means tables, chairs, door handles, elevator buttons, etc. So all of our buildings right now during this limited operations period have been classified into categories with um, category one, the buildings like Dame Smith Hall and dormitories that are open and fully sanitized daily. And then those that are locked and partially utilized, our custodians are going in and really focusing on areas where staff are still going. Um, we also have buildings that are fully closed and they do not receive daily custodial services, but once we return to normal operations, our janitorial crews are gonna systematically sanitize any public gathering spaces and classrooms as a top priority before we go back into those spaces. If a group needs a, um, to request a kind of sterilization or cleanup in a certain area, you can submit a work request and ask for it during limited operations. But during this time period, we are really focusing on the buildings where people are actually in there and indeed doing surface cleaning daily to make sure that the spaces are sanitized. Sounds like you were prepared for that question. Very good, thank you. Well, I think that, uh, the remaining questions that we received, we will be busy making sure that we can be responsive to them. Um, we've had more than 1600 people join us today. Um, you know, New Mexico, our nation, and indeed the entire world is facing an extraordinary public health crisis. And we must act all together to slow the spread of the virus. People in every part of the university are working very hard to protect the health and safety of the university community while preserving our students' opportunities to complete the spring semester. Again, I'm really grateful to this community for being creative, being nimble, when it's come to helping us find solutions to what could possibly be our grandest challenge yet. As the circumstances change, we'll continue to keep you informed of important developments and we will share significant information with you. We are hearing you about the complexity of the communications that we've been sharing and how difficult it can be to keep up. We are actively working for more, uh, working to find more effective ways to let you know what the most up-to-date information is, uh, recognizing that we are just all overwhelmed with the amount of data, amount of information that's out there. So we share that. We're gonna work really hard to make it as easy as we can for you. And let me, uh, most of all, assure you all in the Lobo community that we will get through this together. Let's go Lobos. Thank you.